Today we invited Bertie Lindner, who is specialist on Burma and Burma political affairs and ethnic politics in the country. We're going to discuss post-election scenario and uh, Burma's relation with the giant neighbor, uh, China. And welcome back to the Yawari Bertel. Mm. Thank you. Well, it seems to me that uh, two days after the election, we are sitting here again uh, discussing the scenario here. Taong San Suu Kyi's party, nationally for democracy, is going to win a landslide, mm -hmm. even though there is no official outcome yet. So since you cover a lot on Burma relation with neighboring country, particularly with China and ethnic affairs, I would like to touch on the issue of if any led government comes into power, how is going to play out Burma's relationship with China? It has been very, very complicated. You have once famously mentioned that China always intervene in Burma's internet fans. Yeah. I still remember that, <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people are. So we're sitting between the two countries, China and India. And China is obvious winner over the past yeah. two decades. Remain major and biggest trading partner. But landscape may change in the future. But under the President Tang saying, administration, we saw the suspension of New Song Dam projects in 2011, and the relationship has been strained. And I mean, this is, some, this is something that Annali has to tackle when it comes to power, and how it's going to play out. Well, any government in power in Nipido cannot ignore China. China will always be in there. Cannot they, ignore China. They cannot ignore China. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> China will be there forever. Right. So they would have to have some kind of relationship with China. But you can see also uh, the, uh, the Mitsun affair actually was a kind of watershed in relations between Burma and China. Before that, I think the Chinese were a little overly arrogant. They thought that Burma is our backyard. They're not going to do anything, those funny guys down there. We can control them. Then came the suspension of Mitsun. And I believe that the Chinese were in a state of shock for quite a while after that. Mm -hmm. They did decide, from what I heard, uh, to look more closely at Burmese issues after Mitsun, they probably realized they put all the eggs in one basket. It was not a good idea. So, right. So from what I heard, the Chinese decided to look into three major issues which could cause problems in future relations. The first was the NLD. <clears throat> so they did invite uh, NLD people. It took a while before Aung San Suu Kyi went there. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, other NLD officials <coughs> went to China, mm -hmm. were well received, right. and uh, came back reasonably impressed. And my impression is that uh, the Chinese after that said, okay, uh, NLD is not a problem. Number two on the list was the 8 to 8 generation. Okay. A bit younger, more rebellious, but then they invited the 8 to 8 generation, generation two to China. They were wine and wine. And they said, okay, yeah, maybe a bit of a problem, but nothing serious, we can handle that. Number three on the list, and that was the serious issue, the Burmese media. Right. They had and they were very hostile. Yes. And they certainly studied the Burmese media very carefully and they could see there that here yeah, we got a serious image problem. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese then invited uh, one group after another actually of journalists from here to China and uh, wind them and dine them and took them to see the Great Wall and gave them presents and so on. But it didn't really help. <laughs> but I think that after a year or so the conclusion was that well the media is certainly a problem but we and we have to deal with that, and maybe we have improved our image a little bit. So the, the Chinese embassy here in, uh, in Rangoon was instructed, from what I understand, to be more media savvy, more media friendly. Mm -hmm. To answer phone calls from journalists, to give interviews, right. to, to you know, give That's right. and so on. That's right. Which they've never done before. So they've become a little bit more sophisticated. But I think the bottom line here is that the Chinese are going to sway with the wind. If there is a new government here, they will certainly be Try to be as friendly as possible as it possibly can to the government as well, even if it is NLD. Right, because even in 1990 election, as soon as uh, NLD won the election, there was a Chinese diplomat who came to the headquarters, party headquarters, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, made a visit. That was a quite a significant. Yeah. Uh, in uh, also this year, before the election. 
Chinese President invited Donald Tsai Su Ji and her delegation to Beijing. It was regarded as state level visit, yeah. and uh, China is ready to invest politically if anybody comes into power. Sure, I mean the Chinese. Intelligence network is very efficient, and they probably right. realized long before the government here realized it that NLD was going to win the election. They knew what people, this public sentiments were, what people thought about the government. But they may still be surprised to see that, uh, pleasantly perhaps, that uh, this is going to be a sweeping victory. Yes, no, no, probably nobody has expected this kind of landslide. But I mean, it's more than 10 years ago, I had lunch with a senior advisor to the then Chinese president, Hu Jintao, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked him if um, they were interested in, you know, the main interest in, in Burma was to preserve the status quo, so they could trade through, Bur through right. Burma, get an access to the Indian Ocean and all that. I see. And get access to the mineral resources of this country. And he said, yes, of course. So I said, okay, for that reason, you're not interested in any political change in Burma. And he said, no, we don't want that. We want, we like the present government and uh, we like stability and continuity. But this was immediately, you know, a couple of years after the a referendum in East Timor for independence. Mm -hmm. So I said to this advisor to the president, but you know, sometimes unexpected things happen, like the referendum in East Timor. If someone had said 10 years ago that East Timor was going to become independent, he would have been dismissed as some kind of lunatic. But now East Timor is the independent. They voted for independence and so they become an independent country. So unexpected things do happen. So I said, what would you do in China if Aung San Suu Kyi became Burma's next president? I see. And he said, yes, but we admire Aung San Suu Kyi, which is, which is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously they would prefer at, at that time that uh, the old government, the mm -hmm. then government, would stay in power. But if it changed, I'm certain, I was certain at that time, that China would be one of the first com countries to roll out the red carpet. I, I'm curious at this point that, uh, do you really think that Chinese are believing that Aung San Suu Kyi is going to protect their vested interest in this country and also protect the uh, investment. Because if you look at the you know Chinese investment in this country, you can see the rising, persistent uh, anti-China sentiment, particularly in the north in Mandalay. Sure. And that's why most Burmese are, seems to be uh, pro-West. Yes. Uh, it's because of China. Yes. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the very controversial decision yeah. on uh, Labadao, yeah. the China projects, uh, mining projects, and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was chairperson, yeah. and then she made a decision, and then she had a, a huge confrontation with the um, local CSO and the local populations. Yes, absolutely. And I think that came as a shock for her. It was the first time people challenged her in public. Mm -hmm. The young woman who came up and said, oh, we have nothing to eat. But right, rice and I water. still remember yeah. that. Yeah. And <clears throat> we voted for you, and you're coming, and you're coming to telling us to go home. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she has to make it, to balance that kind of sentiments and the fact that China would always be there. But when you're talking about China and Burma, we should, I think we should also remember that the Chinese, of course, have a very big carrot to wave, you know, mm -hmm. from, you know investment, uh, uh, loans, credits, uh, armed supplies, Trade and, and you, you name it. I mean, they even sort of build churches and clinics up in the north to improve. Not, the yes. So that's the that's the character. They also got a big stick, and the name of this stick is the United One State Army. And we're talking about the so-called peace process here, mm -hmm. but it's not really a peace process because it does involve some rather small and insignificant groups apart from the KNU. Uh, all the major groups, ethnic armed groups, still engaged in uh, combat with the central government, are close to the Chinese border. Not all of them have a close relationship with the Chinese, but the Wa certainly do. And if you look at the weaponry that the Wa have received from China over the past few years, mm -hmm. it's very, very impressive. You're talking about surface air missiles, you're talking about armored personnel carriers, uh, heavy artillery, you know, under 20 millimeter mortars, and so on. This is not the kind of stuff that falls off the back of a truck. I mean, I don't think that uh, the Chinese would like to see the Wa go to war against the central government, but this is a strong deterrent to keep the government's army away and to show the central government, whoever is in power, that, look, we have a foot inside your country. You cannot mess around with us. My next question will be how Chinese back ethnic armed groups, particularly war, the most powerful armies, how would they see 
uh, and uh, the led government. How would they want to see the peace process going forward? I think uh, we are just guessing. We cannot predict yes, the future. Yes, of course. But uh, I think they will, the first attitude will be a bit of wait and see. What is this government's policy going to be towards the ethnic armed groups? Mm -hmm. Are they going to reach out to them for some kind of talks or whatever? But we always have to remember that the military in this country is autonomous. It doesn't take orders from the government. I mean, the government can have any kind of policy. The army will do whatever they want right. anyway. Right, exactly. But the army cannot really totally ignore a popular elected government and what they want because they will cause an unnecessary rift between the military and, and the government. So I think the Chinese would like to wait and see. But I think also the Chinese would like to be seen as a peacemaker. You know how the... Do you China. really think so? China wants to be seen as a peacemaker in this country. In a sense, kind of mediator. I mean, mm -hmm. they certainly don't want Americans. I there. remember that uh, recently some ethnic groups in the north, including Kogan and Wa, called for the China inter yes. Chinese intervention yes. in the conflict in Burma. Yes, I, I think, and the reason why all these groups which did not sign the agreement, which are the major armed groups in the country, the reason why did, they did not sign it is because it was not inclusive. It did not include all the groups, including Kogan. That's them right. That's right. And that, I'm certain, was Chinese pressure. The United States State Army even issued a statement saying that they had promised the authorities in Yunnan not to sign any ceasefire agreement unless it was inclusive, that all the groups were there. This is the first time the United States State Army has said that they promised the Chinese something. Mm -hmm. And I think it was quite significant that they said that. But they were careful enough to say the Yunnan authorities, not the central government, as if the Yunnan authorities were some kind of autonomous <laughs> entity within China. So in this, the question about the Chinese investment, well, Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD-led government, what sort of guarantee that they will have? You know, what kind of uh, gesture that Chinese will be hoping to see? Because of, I think, that there are nervousness among the international, international investors. Some people in the world, or even in the region, want a continuity. It's going to major changes coming sure. in, in the coming months. Well, China's interests in Burma are twofold. One is, of course, economic interests. Uh, There's not as much investment as people think. It's more is extra uh, resource extraction. So That's right. Investment in mining, in forestry, not in manufacturing. But the other interest is, of course, strategic. Because Burma gives the landlocked in the west of Burma, the, the western provinces, an access, an outlet to the sea, to the Indian Ocean. And uh, for China to have that kind of access in the in Indian Ocean is quite important because most of the oil supplies are coming from the Middle East to the states of Malacca and then up to up to, to China. And we know that China, the Chinese are trying to find an alternative route to that, to bypass the, the, the very cramped and potentially dangerous states of Malacca with pipelines through Burma. That is not going that well. These popular pipelines are not particularly popular with the local people where they, where they are, and they're causing a lot of resentment. So China mm -hmm. would have to reevaluate its entire Burma policy after this election. But at, at the same time, I think Don San Suu Kyi and uh, the new government will have to have a, a clear policy on the extractive industries and how to tackle the issue because Absolutely. of the recent J report by the global witness, and uh, it was, it's a wake-up call for a lot of people yeah. in, in the industry as well as to the government and, and, and highlight the corrupt figures yeah. uh, in, in the former regime, in the government, and also in among the cronies. This is going to be mm. one of the biggest issues that uh, the NLD government will have to yeah. handle. Well, the NLD government is, will, will be a sort of popular government, right? I'm sure. And uh, the, the people but they will have to do a lot of unpopular things. Like, well, this is the problem. On the one hand, they have to maintain their popularity. <laughs> That's right. And in order to maintain their popularity, they have to put a stop to this ruthless exploitation of Burma's resources. Right. I mean, go up to Kachin State today, where's the forest? Right. I mean, I, I walked through that area in, in 1986. It's all wiped out. 86, it was beautiful, virgin forest everywhere. The most mm. beautiful scene that I've seen in my life. And it's all gone. It's become timber in China. And it's not only there, Northern Shan State, even along the Chinbin River. Mm -hmm. So uh, this cannot be allowed to continue. But uh, if the government puts an end to it, how is China going to react? I mean, can they persuade the Chinese to do something else, not to cut down all the trees and take all the jade and the mineral resources from this country? 
Well, they would. I think the, any future government would have to take a much tougher line to the China mm -hmm. and say, "Look, this is not on. This is not going to work. If you want to do business with us, fine, but don't come here and you know exploit us like that." Well, as we cover China, and then I think uh, the peace issue mm -hmm. and uh, peace issue, and uh, there's a, a well-known name under President Deng Xiaoping administration, the Nyama Peace Center. And uh, with the shake-up coming, uh, there's, there will be a huge uh, uh, unexpected shake-up yeah. going to take place uh, next year, I believe, when there is a smooth transfer of power. Well, this is part of the uh, transition uh, going forward. Yeah. But what is the future of Nyama Peace Center? Well, uh, I don't think they have much of a future. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't have much future. No, I mean, they'll spend years talking about the technicality, the technical details of the ceasefire agreement, spending millions of euros donated by the European Union and other donors. Right? And what did they achieve in the end? Well, they had a big signing ceremony in Ecuador. Eight groups signed a nationwide ceasefire agreement. Well, first of all, it wasn't particularly nationwide. And of those eight groups, five exist on, on paper. I mean, they have no armies. ABSF gave up its own struggle in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, the Arakan Liberation Party is a small group based on the Thai border. Right. They were together with the KD before. They've got nothing to do with the Arakan army that's actually fighting in, in the north now, with the Kachin and Kokan. Right? That's got right. The Chin National Front, they probably haven't even got a pistol between them. Uh, you got the Pao National Liberation <laughs> Organization, which is a one-man show. Then the current Peace Council, which is an NGO in Mesot. Mm -hmm. So you have three groups left. NGO in Mesot. Yeah, more or less. In Thailand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the current Peace Council. Yes. Right. Then you go to KNU. Yes, that's a genuine group, right? Mm -hmm. But, and as Sean said, Army South, that's the remnants of Kunsa's old drug army. And then you got um, uh, the DKBA, which used to be the Democratic Korean Buddhist Army. And now the Democratic and Benevolent. Korean Benevolent Army, okay. yeah. I mean, they've been a government militia since they broke away from the Kenya That's in the right. 1990s. Mm -hmm. And those three groups, which are all the groups among those eight, who got any armed personnel under the command, are all on the Thai border. And they've been under heavy Thai pressure to sign this agreement because the Thais want to open the border for trade. And the, the Thais want to get access to hydroelectric, hydroelectric power from the Salmon River and so on. So, I mean, this is not, nothing is going to lead to peace in the country. All the major groups, United Wild State Army, the Kachin, Independence mm -hmm. Army, uh, the Palong Army, Kokang, Long, uh, the Transit Army North, Dongla, they did not sign. And these groups together would have between 30 and 40,000 men in arms. So we can't talk about a successful peace right. process here. More likely, this signing ceremony in Epido was a face saving gesture on the part of the NPC to show the donors. That look, we achieve something. We got an agreement. Uh, but but uh, MPCs are very unpopular among the Burmese, among the Burmese intellectuals, and yeah. among the CSOs. But also, there is a theory that uh, there is a theory that the Western donors are investing a lot on uh, MPC, and uh, even there is a new organization formed, and one of mm -hmm. the former MPC members in the uh, government building, but they are NGO. Mm -hmm. But they're getting a lot of huge amount of money from not yeah. from China, of course, yeah. but from 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 the West. Yeah. So I think theory, the conspiracy theory among Burmese is that uh, they know that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and Aung Lee are coming into power. Yeah. The West are giving uh, uh, support uh, uh, to MPC yeah. so that they can remain as NGO yeah. and, uh, in a new atmosphere. But I mean, I can't see how the embassy can possibly justify their existence. They haven't achieved anything more than spend lots of money. And uh, I think you also want to, to remember that <clears throat> China has told several down groups in the north that keep the America out of this. It's not their business. Right. And as long as uh, America is playing in a role there, and I would say even the EU, nothing much is going to be achieved. That's what I mean when I say that China would like to be the mediator here. He wants to be a key player. Yes. And they don't want the West to come there. They don't want the West anymore. And also, I'm a little bit uh, sidetracking, but, but also related to MPC, because uh, MPC, some of the 
prominent MPC members or founders or also uh, presidential advisors. Uh, most of them came back from the uh, ASL and from the West. Some of them educated in Harvard and, uh, and Oxford universities. They became uh, apologists to President things in government. And, um, and um, uh, since he came in, the president has asked people to join his administration uh, to be as advisor to the, the president. I wonder if these advisors are smart and sophisticated and given lots of advice to, to the government and the president. Uh, this government should be re-elected, don't you think so? Well, That's the irony, <laughs> I find it. Yeah, that's absolutely. If they're giving such good advice, why, how come <coughs> the government lost the election? You know? Yeah. So I think it's complete, complete defeat. Yes. I mean, total defeat. Yeah, they used to be a crush patient, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's worse yeah. than the NUP in 1990, the yeah. Party. So I, I'm assuming that, that these presidential advisors are looking for a, a new pasture. I think they're looking for new jobs, most of them, really. Yeah. <laughs> and I even heard that some of them have applied for new jobs. They applied for new jobs several months ago. But they realize that this is there's no future here. Also, this morning I bumped into uh, one of the so-called specialists on Burma, and uh, and he's talking about talent moving from this to that place, mm -hmm. which means uh, he was suggesting that there are talents in the government or government associate, uh, and only needs a talent, mm -hmm. lack of talents. So this talent has to move transfer there. Mm -hmm. Do you find that? No, I mean there's a lot of talent in this country. And they're not necessarily in the present government. <laughs> right. <laughs> if they have so much talent, yeah. why are they have, why are they lost in the yeah. election? I mean, look at one thing, for instance. I mean, all is okay. They're not living outside the country, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of them came back. Look, look at all these people who came from Singapore to vote. Right. In a chartered airplane. Right. These are talented people. Yes. They have good jobs in Singapore. They're professionals, and it's like they didn't come here to vote for the USDP. I think we can say that with certainty. <laughs> so as, there's a lot of talent potential talent behind this government as well. Even if the actual ministers may not be that experienced and so on, mm -hmm. there's enough of well-educated people who will, behind, will be solidly behind a, a new government. Thank you very much, Patrick. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>